Thanks, Pavel. Um, so this is joint work with Dragan Bosnaki and Ruud Kuiper from the Netherlands. So first of all, uh, many people, when I start saying I work on modular termination verification, start thinking about analysis. So this is not about termination analysis. I'm not going to be proposing any clever algorithms here. That's the first thing. So what we are proposing is an approach for uh, doing paper and pencil proofs of terminations of programs uh, modularly. And what does that mean? So we propose a notion of module correctness such that if one succeeds in producing a paper and pencil proof of the correctness of each of a program's modules, then the program terminates. So this is very, a very standard notion of modular verification. And so what, is, what does modular correctness mean? It means that the module satisfies its specification, assuming that the modules it imports satisfy theirs. And the main contribution of this work is not what I just said, because that's very standard. The main contribution is one uh, approach for writing module specifications uh, that are sufficiently expressive to allow verification of client code and sufficiently abstract to allow module implementation evolution. So to, to re-emphasize this, for any given modular verification approach, there are typically very many ways to assign specifications to the modules of a program such that the program verifies, but only some of those ways will allow you to e evolve the modules of the program uh, arbitrarily or in ways that, that you would expect would be allowed. So some of those ways would restrict the evolution of the modules uh, unacceptably. And the, the goal here is to come up with a way to write specifications that doesn't restrict module evolution. So any modification that doesn't break clients should be allowed by the approach. So first we're going to go a little bit into the notion of modular verification <coughs> in general. <coughs> Sorry. And then we're looking at uh, modular termination verification in a number of steps. So what is modular verification? Consider this very simple program. We have a square root method that uh, computes a very rough approximation of the square root of a number. Um, it's the first iteration of newton repson I think. And then the second uh, me method, uh, vector size, computes an approximation of the size of a vector. And the, the third method, the main method, calls vector size and performs an assertion about the result of that call. Now if we are going to do whole program, so we can do whole program verification of this program, so what we're going to do is, we're going to look at this assert, and we're going to see how can we convince ourselves that this uh, will always hold. So uh, in whole program verification, if you want to reason about a method call, you will look at the body of that method, taking into account the specific calling context. So here we're calling vector size with arguments three and four. If we then look into the body of vector size, we see that it calls square root with a positive number. And if we then look into square root, we see that it will return a non-negative number. So then we know that our assert will uh, succeed. Now this is one way of reasoning about programs, and it has the advantage that you don't need any uh, additional annotations or anything. The downside is, of course, if you then modify your program, for example, we change square root so that it computes a slightly more accurate approximation of the square root, then we have to redo the entire <coughs> reasoning because we didn't record any intermediate results of our reasoning. So now we have to look at the entire program again. So that's why we want to do modular verification. So OK, now let's try to do modular verification. To do that, we need to come up with three things. One is a specification formalism. The second is a notion of module correctness. And the third is uh, a, a specification approach. Now here, for, <coughs> for standard safety verification, we're going to use plain old preconditions and postconditions. So we're going to assign the following specifications to these methods. methods. The specification of method square root says, if the argument is non-negative, then the result is non-negative. And then verification of such a uh, program means we're going to look at each module and see if it satisfies its specification, assuming that other modules satisfy theirs. So uh, method square root satisfies its contract. So that's fine. Uh, so now let's verify method vector size. 
So it calls square root, and we're going to look only at the specification of square root. Since we're calling it with the sum of two squares, we know it's a non-negative number, so the precondition of square root is satisfied. Therefore, we can assume that the postcondition holds, and therefore we know that the postcondition of factor size holds as well. So that's fine too. And finally, since uh, the postcondition of factor size says that it returns a non-negative result, we know that the main method, that the assertion in the main method also succeeds. So this program is now verified. If we now modify one of the modules, for example here, then we just have to check that it still satisfies its specification, and then, we're again, then we again know that the entire program will be correct. So that's fine. So that's why we want to do modular verification. Now let's go into termination verification. So again, to perform modular termination verification, we have to come up with a specification formalism, a notion of module correctness, and then an approach for writing specifications that is both expressive and abstract. Now for the specification formalism and for the module correctness approach, I'm going to use very standard approaches. So that's nothing new going on here. So I'm going to assign to each method um, something like a measure or a ranking function uh, or a decreases clause, as it's often called. And I'm just going to call it uh, the level. So I'm going to assign to each method an expression uh, called the level. And it's going to evaluate to uh, what I call a level value, which is going to be from some universe of levels with a well-founded order on it. And a well-founded order is one that doesn't allow infinite descending sequences. Uh, now, the choice of this universe of levels is going to be a parameter of this specification formalism and this modular correctness approach. And actually, the rest of the talk is going to be entirely about how to choose this universe of levels and how to choose the specific levels to assign to each method. So uh, a very uh, simple and naive approach to assign levels to this particular program would be to use the natural numbers as the levels and to assign these levels. Now notice that for this particular program, this works perfectly. Each module, uh, by the way, I haven't said uh, what the notion of module correctness is here, and this will be the obvious one, namely that whenever a method at some level L calls another method at level L prime, then L prime must be less than L in the well-founded order on levels. And this immediately uh, tells you that you will not have infinite uh, call chains. So it's very simple and very straightforward. Now, for this program, this works. Uh, these levels uh, are such that the program verifies. However, uh, are these specifications sufficiently abstract? And the answer is clearly no. I would like to be able to uh, refactor an arbitrary method and introduce a helper method to help execute that method. For example, in square root, I perform an averaging operation. I would like to be able to introduce an average method that factors out the averaging. But now, I will not be able to verify this modified program without changing the specification of square root and even of all of the other methods as well. Because the level of square root is now zero, so I cannot call average because its level is also zero. So what the way that we propose to fix this is to use method names as levels. So we will define a partial order on method names and to do that, we will first be a little bit more explicit about the import relation on modules. And first, we're going to be more explicit about the modules themselves. So we're going to be introducing, uh, inserting these methods into classes, and we're going to use classes as modules. And then we're going to define an import relation between the classes. We're going to say util imports math and main imports util. So the, the significance of the import relation is that we define module correctness as a module satisfies its specification assuming that imported modules satisfy theirs. So we can assume that imported modules satisfy their specification. That's why we need to import math inside of util and why we need to import util in main. Also, we're going to assume that the module import relation is acyclic. So this is, uh, this is pretty clear if you think of the definition of module correctness, otherwise you would get cyclic uh, reasoning. Uh, and thanks to that, we have actually a, a partial order on the modules, and therefore a partial order on methods induced by the module order. 
So we can now use method names as levels. And the approach that we're going to uh, use is we're going to simply assign the name of a method as its level. So square root gets level square root. And in general, uh, we consider these method names as being qualified with the class. But in case there is no um, ambiguity for uh, abbreviation, I will uh, uh, drop the class name if uh, there's no uh, chance for uh, ambiguity. So notice that this uh, specification allows us to verify this program, and it also allows us to introduce the average method, helper method, inside of the square root method. Since we introduce average before square root, it's less in the order, so uh, the square root method still verifies. Okay, so now we end up with our first version of the specification pattern that, uh, or approach that we propose, which is that every method gets its own name as the level. But of course, this is only for a very restricted subset of the programming language. The uh, interesting part comes when we start looking at dynamic binding. So now let's look at a program with dynamic binding. So we have an interface function with an apply method that takes a number and returns a number. And then we have a method, static method derivative that takes a function f and computes an approximation of its derivative at uh, point x. To do so, it calls f.apply. And then we have an implementation of this function called zero func, uh, which is the constant function zero. And then we have a main uh, class and method that calls the derivative of zero func at zero. Now, how to do modular verification of such a program? In particular, how to modularly verify the derivative method? Uh, so to reason ab modularly about a uh, dynamically bound method call like f.apply, we're going to not look at uh, the um, methods to which this call is dynamically bound, but we're going to look at the statically resolved method, so at function.apply. And we're going to assign a specification to interface methods as well as class methods, and to reason about uh, dynamically bound methods, we're going to check that they are correct with respect to the uh, specification of the interface. And then for each method that uh, overrides an interface method or implements an interface method, we're going to uh, check it against the interface method's specification. So what we need to do is we need to assign a level to each of these methods, including function.apply, we're not specifying a separate level for zero func.apply because it inherits the specification from function. So let's try to apply, so which level should we pick? Let's try to apply the specification pattern that we came up with before. So we use the name of the method as its level. For main, this is trivial, so we just use level main. For function, we want to say the name of the dynamically bound method. Uh, because we're not going to include interface method names into our partial order. We're not going to use those as levels, only class method names. And actually, we will allow this kind of expression. We're going to allow the expression saying the apply method of the class of the receiver. But for abbreviation, we will just write it like this. This dot apply, which actually means class of this dot apply. And then finally, we need to come up with a level for the derivative function. And here it becomes interesting because just applying the pattern that we saw before, we should pick level derivative. But now we cannot verify the body of derivative because it calls f.apply and we don't know in general when verifying this method whether f.apply is indeed less than derivative or not. In, indeed, in this particular example, f.apply is zero func.apply, which is greater than derivative. Or actually, it's not related because zero func doesn't import util. So they're unrelated uh, method names in the partial order. Um, so this doesn't work. Of course, it's clear that we're calling f.apply. So uh, you might think that you just put f.apply here. And indeed, for this particular example, that works. So we're violating the pattern that we saw before. But for this program, we can verify the program like this by putting f.apply as the level of derivative. However, we're violating the pattern at a cost because now we're no longer able to introduce helper methods, a helper method for derivative to help uh, execute its function. So for example, if we introduce a derivative helper and we delegate in derivative to derivative helper, 
we can no longer verify derivative without changing its specification. Because both derivative and derivative helper, helper have level f dot apply, and the levels are therefore not decreasing. So this also doesn't work. So what we need to do, or what we propose actually, is to use not, uh, so what we want to say is that derivative can call um, derivative helper as well as f dot apply. And to express that, we will use not method names as levels, but multisets of method names. And it's well known in the termination community that multisets are often a useful tool for this. So um, this isn't entirely out of the blue. So um, we will assign the following multiset as the level of derivative. So derivative itself and f dot apply. And derivative helper will have the level derivative helper f dot apply. Notice that now both methods verify successfully. Um, because when we call derivative helper, we are replacing derivative in the multiset with, with a smaller element. So the multiset order, by the way, is defined as follows. Uh, you can go from a given multiset to a smaller one by taking any element and replacing it with any number of smaller elements. So here we're doing that, so we get a smaller multiset. And also when we're calling f dot apply inside of derivative helper, we're removing derivative helper and replacing it with nothing, so that's also a smaller multiset. Okay, so this works, but we are, this only works because the only function implementation that we have is a very simple class. It's a class that doesn't have any references to any other objects. So the body of apply doesn't perform any dynamically bound method calls itself. So now what do we do if we have complex objects? So now look at uh, an extension of this program, which also has another implementation of the function interface called plus one func, which takes as a field another uh, a pointer to another function object. And it calls, in its apply method, it calls the apply method of f plus one. So now the um, specifications that we saw before no longer work because the specification of function.apply says that the level is this.apply, but for plus one func's apply method, that is not sufficient to be able to call f.apply, because there's no known relationship between this.apply and f.apply in plus one func. So what we need in general is to be able, so what we propose is that we associate a, a multiset of methods with each object. We will call this multiset the dynamic depth of the object. And how do we associate uh, such a multiset with an object? Uh, by the way, so for uh, plus one func, the solution would be, w uh, a solution might be to have uh, as the specification of function dot apply this dot apply comma this dot f dot apply. But that would, uh, that would work for plus one func, but it wouldn't make any sense for zero func. So this is also not good. You could try to have a con conditional expression as the level. So if I am a plus one fund, then I need this, and otherwise I need just this dot apply. But even this doesn't work because if the, um, I mean, it does work in this particular program because plus one funk in main takes a zero funk as an argument. But in general, you don't know that the argument of plus, or the field of plus one is itself a simple object. So it might again be a plus one, so it might also need more than just this dot f dot apply. So this also doesn't work. And it's also not abstract, of course. So what we will uh, do is associate a dynamic depth with each object, and we will do that as follows. We will use abstract predicate families. That's an existing approach uh, for specifying dynamic binding. So we will have in function a predicate valid, and it will take as a parameter uh, a parameter called depth of type method bag, or multiset of, of methods. So, by the way, these predicates are also used already for um, safety verification to express invariance of objects and those kinds of things. So it's, we're piggybacking on top of an existing practice of having predicates in interfaces. So then the, um, the spec of apply would look as follows. In the requires clause, we will require that the object is valid for some uh, depth d. So in the contract of apply, d is a, is a logical variable, and uh, one should read this contract as being universally quantified over d. So the contract should hold for all values of d. So the, the body of apply should satisfy the contract for all values of d. So if 
the uh, object satisfies this dot valid of D, then the level of apply will be D. Mm -hmm. So this allows us to apply, to as, uh, associate arbitrary multisets of method names with objects. So let's see how we apply this to the example implementations. So for zero func, we implement valid as follows. So each class that implements the interface will give a definition for this predicate. And the definition in the case of zero func is that the depth is simply this dot apply, as before. And notice that the implementation of apply verifies. In the case of plus one func, predicate valid is a little bit more complex. Now it says that uh, f is valid as well. And it will be valid for some value of its dynamic depth, df. And the depth of the receiver is then this dot apply multiset union df. And this will uh, allow us to verify the apply method of plus one func. Because if the level of apply is this dot apply uh, union df, and the level of f dot apply is df, then we know that we are decreasing our level. Um, so, in general, these uh, predicate definitions can include occurrences of the predicates that we are defining. Specifically, in case of plus one func, the definition of valid here uses valid in its body. So, in general, one could wonder, is this always well defined? Can we give a, a, a clear meaning to these um, predicates in general? And the answer is, we can if we impose a restriction on predicate definitions, which is that occurrences of a predicate inside of a predicate definition should always be in positive positions. And a positive position means not under a negation, not on the left-hand side of an implication, and that kind of thing. So in the end, what we get is that the, um, the interpretation of a predicate body will be monotonic in the interpretation of the recursive occurrences. And that allows us to perform a fixed point operation and get a clear meaning for these predicates. Another way to put that is to look at these predicate definitions as an inductive definition. And each predicate definition in a class contributes an inference rule to the, the definition of the predicate over the entire program. So we accumulate all of the definitions over the entire program. This gives us a set of inference rules. And as we know, these have a well-defined meaning. Uh, this is, again, as I said, existing work from Parkinson and Bierman in Popol 2005, the use of these abstract predicates. So what we do is we piggyback on them to, have to define these dynamic depths of objects. Given that we have such a specification for function, we can now give a specification to the derivative method of util. So it takes a function f as an argument, and it will require that this function is valid. And it ha will have some dynamic depth d. And then the level of derivative will be itself, derivative, multiset union D. This will allow it to call f.apply, as well as any helper methods that it wants to introduce in the future. Finally, uh, we will have to verify main against its level main. So how do we do that? Let's look closer at main. So let's write the body of main in more detail, or more uh, elaborately. So it first first creates an object uh, of class zero func, f1. And by looking at the definition of zero func dot valid, we can conclude that f1 dot valid will hold for dynamic depth zero func dot apply. Then we create uh, an object of class plus one func with f1 as an argument. Again, by looking at the definition of uh, plus one func dot valid, we can conclude that f2 dot valid holds for dynamic depth plus one func dot apply, comma, zero func dot apply. And from that it follows that the level of derivative of F2 will be derivative plus one func apply, zero func apply. We have to prove that this is less than main, and it is because all of these three methods are below main in the uh, order of method names, and therefore this is a valid multiset relation. Um, so that's so much for complex objects. But the proof of the main method did something a little bit unpleasant. Um, it looked inside of the predicate definitions to, uh, of the classes that it used in order to verify main. So in general, we want to avoid that. We want to, that to be more abstract. So we want to do abstract object construction. So we will introduce in each class 
a constructor method. So here we have a static method create, which in its post condition gives an upper bound on the dynamic depth of the returned object. So it says, I will give you uh, an object such that it's valid with some depth d, which is less than myself, than create. Similarly, plus one func will have a create method that takes a function object, and it's, uh, it will require that this function object is valid, and it will ensure that the resulting object is valid for some depth d, which is bounded by create multiset union df. And thanks to these post conditions, we can verify a version of main that uses these constructor methods. So we know that f1 will, uh, f1's depth will be bounded by zero func, that f2's depth will be bounded by plus one func, zero func, and therefore that the level of derivative is below main. So finally, we end up with the uh, proposed specification style of this work. So uh, in interfaces, we introduce predicates with uh, an, a parameter of type method bag. We will use this in the specifications of the methods of the interface as follows. When a method takes a, an object as an argument, it will require that it's valid, and it will use the depth of that object for its own level. And finally, when we implement uh, a valid predicate for a class that has object references itself, we will compute the depth of the object from the depth of the objects to which it refers. And uh, to do abstract object creation, we have create methods that uh, perform an upper or that supply an upper bound on the returned objects. So that was the content of this talk. I will now conclude. So the contribution is that, to the, the best of our knowledge, this is the first approach for modular verification of termination of object-oriented programs. The extras in the paper are as follows. Uh, we discuss how to deal with methods that take multiple objects as arguments, or interface methods that take other objects as arguments. We look at recursion, direct and mutual recursion. Uh, and actually, the, the system proposed in the paper is based on separation logic. And there, instead of level clauses, we use first-class call permissions. These have the following uh, advantages. They can be hidden inside of predicates, which is useful for continuation passing style programs. And they can be passed between threads in a concurrent program. In the TR, there are additional extras. Uh, first of all, we point out how you can combine this approach with dead a deadlock-freedom approach, such as the one that Peter built upon also in his previous talk, so uh, the ESOP 2010 work to verify the complete termination <coughs> of concurrent programs. We want also point out that if you use the levels that we propose here as weight levels, then you can uh, op uh, transparently introduce private locks into modules without having to change client code or re-verify client code. Also, we show how to prove termination of compare and swap loops in fine-grained concurrent programs. And we, prove, we show how you can encode uh, liveness certain kinds of liveness properties of non-terminating programs into this system. Um, validation is an important issue. We have some examples in the paper, and we also implemented um, the, uh, our approach in, the very fast, in our very fast tool and verified some of the examples there. But definitely, there is a lot more uh, experimentation that needs to be done to see whether this approach really works for all kinds of programming patterns. Thank you very much. Thanks. So um, in the conclusions, you mentioned the implementation. But at the beginning, you emphasized so much that it's a technique for pencil and paper proofs. Mm -hmm. So why do you make this qualification? Is because I really want to make it clear that I'm not doing an analysis. People always, a lot of people that I talked to had this confusion that I was trying to automatically, automatically prove programs. And I wanted to make it very clear I'm not trying to automatically prove anything. Thank you. Okay, thanks. So I'm wondering whether it would be fair to say that you are doing the following. You need to, we need to prove termination of programs. And for this, what we need is a well-founded ordering that gets smaller every time we make a method call, create an object, and so on. However, if it's going to be modular, uh, 
that's, that's very difficult because we don't know, want to know about the other classes. So what you are doing essentially, I think, is you are giving me a way of defining constraints on this well-founded ordering through these predicates and these existentials in the predicates that say that something is uh, wh where we're defining the predicates. I don't know. It's a very vague uh, uh, impression. I think it's reasonably uh, accurate, yes, the way to characterize it, yes. You mentioned that you just need to verify that you imports are not cyclic. Do you have a nice way to do that modularly, which doesn't involve the same sort of problems as just assigning natural numbers to things and checking that right. they fit? So um, checking that the import graph is acyclic is really something you do at composition time. So someone who actually takes a bunch of jars uh, and puts them on the command line, then they have to check that there's no cyclicity there. So uh, you could put this into some kind of repository like OSGI or something that it checks that there are no cyclic dependencies. So I, I had a related question. Hi. All right. um, to what extent could you adapt the technique if we had a programming language in which you were allowed cyclic module imports? So then I, I think I would define two kinds of modules. Uh, once where, and then these cyclic cycles of modules would actually be in one super module, so to speak. Because if these modules depend on each other, then I think the developers of those modules need to know about each other. So they can just c sit together and define a super module in which these modules live. Would it be possible to make use of some of the, the features that you use for, I think you called them up calls earlier in the talk? So you can abstract away a lot of the details of what's going on in a sense behind the scenes inside a method call. Could you use that to somehow modularly reason about, I mean, write, write specifications on the method modules, but nonetheless be able to reason about them without looking at each other's code? So um, what in, this in this approach, you verify a module without looking at other modules' code, right? Um, so how is that different from what you're proposing? Well, in this approach, you forbid cyclic imports. Yes. I'm wondering if there's any chance of allowing cyclic imports and using the kinds of abstraction that you have in your specifications to nonetheless be able to verify termination in a modular way without looking at each other's code. So notice that a module developer is not going to check absence of cycles, right? It's the, the guy who composes all of the modules that he buys from different people. He will check, am I, is, some, is one of my vendors actually relying on another vendor to uh, perform the functionality, and the other vendor is looking on at the first vendor to perform the functionality, so no one's actually doing any work. So that's like a pathological situation which cannot be allowed. So that's all I'm saying. You cannot have Microsoft using an Apple library, and then Apple saying, I'm going to use the Microsoft library, and none of them actually implement the square root. So that kind of work, that, that can never uh, work, you know. Someone has to decide, I'm going to implement square root and not ask the other guy to implement square root. Okay, thanks. <laughs>